All right, folks, welcome back. Today it's a little bit different. We're not actually breaking down the biomechanics of fighters or striking or anything like that or grappling. We're going to look at the growing sport of power slapping. And so we're going to look at the mechanics of potentially why this is a pretty dangerous sport. I think most people know that intuitively. Uh, I got this view because I wanted to show the mechanics all the way from the ground. And then the next view, so we're going to look at the actual person doing the slapping. And then we're going to take a look at the person being slapped in slow-mo. Okay, so that'll be, that'll be pretty fun to look at. We'll talk about some of the mechanics behind what happens whenever you acutely lose consciousness or that knockout uh, that we see quite often in power slap and in the UFC and boxing and other sports. Okay, so let's get started. So first, uh, you guys know that I talk about this kind of a nebulous term called the kinetic chain. I, I kind of define it as the ability to transmit force through the body and then through the, through the trunk, the hips in the trunk, and then through the extremities. Okay, that's still pretty nebulous. Uh, a lot of people who talk about the kinetic chain use it in very different ways, so I just wanted to lay that foundation there. So we're going to start from the ground. Okay, if you've watched any of my previous videos, you know that I like to start from the ground and work all the way through the trunk and through the extremity. Okay, so whenever he brings his shoulders back, okay, I want you to notice a couple of things. His hips, so his hips stay relatively, if you were to draw a line between his two hips, the two uh, trochant, greater trochanters, the ones that are the, the hip bones that you could feel, you would notice that it's pretty much perpendicular to the line of the table. Okay, and his hip, that line doesn't move very much, okay? It may move, oh, we'll say like 30 degrees or so, but look at the plane of his shoulders. If you were to draw a line across from shoulder to shoulder, that is essentially perpendicular to the plane of his shoulders, okay? And that's really important. He also kind of squats down on his right. So we're seeing dorsiflexion, knee flexion, and hip flexion. So a lot of people talk about triple extension. This is triple flexion dorsiflexion at the ankle, flexion at the hip or knee, and then flexion at the hip. And this is so that he can push using his plantar flexors, his knee extensors, and his hip extensors, muscles like the gastroxoleus complex, and then to extend the knee he would use muscles like the quad, and then to extend the hip, muscles like the glutes and the hamstrings, to send his, it, it's pretty much a triple extension movement from the leg that's doing this. So he's sending his center of mass forward, but most of the actual momentum or the force is going to happen around the, this transverse plane, so along the vertical axis of his spine. Okay, so it's, it's called torque, so a rotational force about an axis. Notice that most of this actually happens. Now he is, he is getting a little bit of lumbo-pelvic rotation to the left, but most of this rotation, if you watch his shoulders, his thoracic spine, and his particularly the thoracolumbar spine around that T12 L1 area, that's where most of his rotation is occurring. He makes contact, and then his shoulders are virtually perpendicular, except it's the other shoulder that's in it forward. So he's, he's going almost at 180 degrees of rotation with his shoulders when he makes that contact. Okay, so we're up to the hip and we're up to the thoracic spine. Let's look at his shoulder girdle. Okay, so his, his scapula is nice and retracted here. He's in a position of horizontal abduction at the glenohumeral joint. But notice that he does not actually horizontally adduct that much. Okay, we've talked about in the past the stretch reflex that we see sometimes in, in fighters that throw their hips forward and then follow with the shoulders or if they're throwing a kick they'll go their shoulder they'll throw their shoulders forward first and then they'll kick it gets a big stretch reflex on the muscles like the internal and external obliques in the trunk and sometimes if they're throwing a hook with this horizontal adduction you'll see it in the pec major and in muscles like the anterior delt that are influenced or excuse me that that create the motion of horizontal adduction adduction so whenever he does this He's not actually doing that. So the muscles that are involved in this are the external oblique, since it does contralateral rotation, it's the external oblique of the side of his slapping arm, and then the internal oblique of the side of, or on the opposite side. He's also getting a little bit of spinal extension because he's having to reach across. I think there's a rule saying that you, you can't hit with a certain part of your hand. Uh, I, I'm not sure about those rules. Um, I do know you have to keep your feet planted and, and correct me if I'm wrong about any of that. But essentially he's getting all of his power 
from his hips and his trunk and a nice isometric engagement from muscles like the rhomboids and the uh, the trap, particularly, particularly the middle and the upper trap, uh, and then a nice isometric contraction in muscles like the posterior delt when it comes to keeping it in the, the glenohumeral joint in a, an abducted position, horizontally abducted position, and then whenever he starts to come forward, he also has to have an isometric contraction of the pec and the anterior delt, um, and obviously the forearm muscles, because whenever he makes contact, he has to make sure that when he follows through, his arm's not just going limp. Uh, then the guy obviously loses consciousness, but we'll talk about that in a second. So one more time, he he flexes the the right leg and then triple extends that lower extremity to get door, plantar flexion, knee extension, and hip extension, which plantar flexion is just ankle extension. I know that's confusing. Got a little bit of uh, an extended posture because he's reaching across the table. You can see it actually move whenever he reaches over. But a little bit extended, but most of that rotation, even though he's using his arm on the other side to create more torque about that force about the vertical axis, is coming from the thoracolumbar and the thoracic spine and the muscles of the trunk. His, he doesn't actually horizontally adduct, makes contact, and then his shoulder, the plane of his shoulders is 180 degrees perpendicular or it has traveled 180 degrees and they're perpendicular to the line of the shoulder of the other. So that is what it looks like when you use the kinetic chain very, very well. All right, so the mechanics of the guy getting knocked out, okay, or the person getting knocked out. I know women do the sport too. But it's essentially, I want you to pay attention to how much rotation and in a, and in a second, how much cervical side bending is happening here. The reason I want you to pay attention to that is the uh, and I've done a video on this in the past if you want to check it out, the, the physiology of a knockout uh, seems to be present most in rapid cervical rotation and rapid cervical side bending or a combination of the two. So you notice that whenever this person gets hit, what we would consider maybe not on the button but a little bit higher than the button, but it produces forceful cervical rotation. And what we think is happening here is axons, which are part of the nerve cell called the neuron, axons actually are, are, are part of the, the transmission unit of the cell, okay? So they have, and all cells have ion channels. We think that there's a small disruption, I say we, the people who study this for a living, think that there is a small disruption that occurs whenever that forceful traction happens to those axons, okay? So whenever somebody hits you, and it's hard to notice, whenever it's happening at full speed. But whenever you get that forceful and really quick cervical rotation, we think that those ion channels are disrupted within the axon, uh, and then they quickly kind of heal themselves back. And so what, that's why it's the acute loss of consciousness and then why it seems to come back so quickly. It's called mechanoporation. Uh, and again, go watch the video if you wanna see that happen. But, or if you wanna see me break that down a little bit more in detail, I go through the history of that. But I really think that this slow motion here does a really good job of showing that forceful rotation that we don't really think about. And notice also, he starts to, all, like it's, it's almost like a whiplash effect. So his, his right cervical rotation has happened so forcefully that the muscles that rotate it back to the left are contracting and trying to bring it back to the left. So it's a whiplash motion. It's just not the typical whiplash that we see in something like a car accident. I wanted to show you this one too because I said something about lateral flexion and we didn't actually get to see it in that last view. This is a really good example of that. So when the, when the slapper makes contact, I want you to almost, if he were only serv like rotating the head uh, in, into cervical rotation, you would see his forehead kind of move with the rest of his body. But if you just take a, almost take it like a stick and drive it straight through his forehead, and that axis of rotation would be kind of like he was doing like a bobblehead motion. He doesn't, you can see how the axis of rotation is actually almost about his forehead or kind of like the center of his face than if the axis of rotation were down his spine. So this is a combination of cervical rotation because he is getting some rotation and lateral flexion. And those are the two motions that they, they seem to think cause the most traction at those axons and disrupt those ion channels for that certain amount of time and enough ion channels to cause that loss of consciousness, which is a pretty important part of it. So 
Think about that whenever you're watching this again, uh, how much cervical rotation actually happens or how much you can see, and then if we slow it down, how much. Uh, now, I'm not saying that it happens all the time, but most of the time, and this is not like a, a fully fleshed out theory, but what happens most of the time is you'll see this rapid forceful rotation and or side bending to cause the knockout. But I think it's pretty damn dangerous. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if it's necessarily smart to do. I, I mean, I train, I train Muay Thai and, and Jiu Jitsu and I, like, trust me, I'm a combat sport enthusiast, but I like having somebody just slap the shit out of me undefended doesn't seem like something I want to do on a, on a random Tuesday. So let me know what you think in the comments and uh, we'll see you next time.